Welcome to the Robert J. Morgan Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping you believe and cherish the Bible and to learn and love Christian history and hymnody. I'm producer Joshua Rowe, introducing your host, Robert J. Morgan. Rob has written dozens of books with titles like The Red Sea Rules, 100 Bible Verses Everyone Should Know by Heart, and Then Sings My Soul. His newest book, 100 Bible Verses That Made America, is a biblical tour through American history and releases in February of 2020, but can be pre-ordered now. Visit robertjmorgan.com for more details and for free downloads related to this resource or pre-order from your favorite online retailer. And now, here's your host, Robert J. Morgan. Hello, this is Robert J. Morgan talking about my book, 100 Bible Verses That Made America. My thesis, trying to explain American history without its Bible, is like trying to understand the human body without its bloodstream. Had there been no Bible, there would have been no America as we know it, and perhaps there would have been no United States of America at all. Many modern revisionist historians are erasing the Bible's influence on American history. But no eraser on earth can truly do that. The story is so deeply embedded and so amazingly wonderful that it's worth repeating, retelling, and remembering. Let's begin at the beginning, the pilgrims. We sometimes think the pilgrims who came to America were the first Europeans to colonize the New World. But of course, that isn't true. The Spanish actually founded the city of St. Augustine, Florida in 1565, over a half century before the pilgrims came. The pilgrims were not even the first English settlers. In 1587, over 100 English men and women came to America and established a colony on Roanoke Island on New York's Outer Banks, not far from where the Wright brothers would later test their airplane. But when British ships visited the area later, all signs of the colonists were gone. What happened to them is something of a mystery. When I was a boy, our family visited the Outer Banks, and we went to the outdoor drama about the event. Maybe you've visited there, too, the Lost Colony. It's America's longest-running outdoor drama. It started in 1937, and it's still going strong on Roanoke Island, and they still haven't found those settlers. Exactly 20 years after the Lost Colony, the British tried again. This time the colonizers landed in the Tidewater area of Virginia and established Jamestown close to the modern-day Williamsburg. This was a commercial venture and it was the scene of terrible suffering for years to come. At one point, colonists were reduced to alleged cannibalism. The third significant British attempt to colonize America was the coming of the Pilgrims, the emigrants on board the Mayflower that landed on Cape Cod in 1620. This is the group that Americans know the best. Why is that? What's so special about them? Why is it we celebrate them so much, revere them so deeply, and reenact their stories in thousands of school plays and skits every Thanksgiving? I believe the difference was spiritual. The other ventures were commercial, but the Mayflower passengers involved Christians who were risking their lives to seek religious freedom for their families. They were born along by faith. They risk everything for the opportunity of raising their family without fear of religious persecution. And this is their story. In the 1500s and 1600s, the Protestant Reformation spread across Europe like a great revival of faith. People got back to reading the Bible for themselves. They got back to the essential doctrines of the Scripture. They got back to being saved by grace and through faith. But in England, the changes didn't go very far. King Henry VIII declared himself as the head of the church, displacing the Pope. But it was a political move. The British state church operated just about the same, only under the oversight of the British monarch, who was corrupt. But there were some within the Anglican Church, the Church of England, who wanted to purify the church and bring about real change and true revival. They were called Puritans. And some of those Puritans wanted to completely separate from the official state church and have their own autonomous congregations, and they were called Separatists. The Puritans and Separatists were 
fiercely persecuted by the government. They inevitably offended the king or the queen or whoever was in power. They were fined. They were rounded up and jailed. They were tortured. They were slain. And many of them fled for their lives, crossing the English Channel and settling in Holland, where there was greater freedom of religion. Up in Scrooby, England, well north of London, there was a congregation of about 100 members led by, among others, Pastor John Robinson. The church met in the manor house of a local official named William Brewster. That very house, Scrooby Manor, still stands today. It's a private home now, but there are great pictures of it online. In the fall of 1607, this church, the entire congregation, realized they would have to leave England or lose their freedom of worship. The persecution was so great, King James I was determined to drive the separatists out of the land. So they were among those who decided to flee to Holland. It took a while, and there were dangers and disappointments along the way, but eventually the congregation settled in the university city of Leiden, Holland. There they formed the English Separatist Church at Leiden. John Robinson was the pastor, and William Brewster was the ruling elder. The church grew to several hundred. John Robinson became involved in the theology department of the local university, and he wrote several essays, pamphlets, and books, some of them defending the Separatist doctrine and the right of Christians to be free of governmental control. But it was difficult for an entire growing congregation of English immigrants to exist in a foreign culture, there were language problems, there were occupational struggles, and they were especially concerned that their teenagers were becoming more Dutch than English and losing their heritage. That's when someone had a radical idea. Why not go to America? It was not feasible for the entire congregation to relocate across the ocean all at once to an unexplored and dangerous continent, but about a hundred of them committed to the trip though in the end only about half of that number actually made the journey. Pastor John Robinson wanted to go, but it was impossible for him, so he led his congregation to the harbor and held a service, sending off those who were going. This is one of those services that should never be forgotten, the send-off service in which a brave congregation sent out over 40 of their number on a dangerous mission to establish a town and a church in another world. Pastor John Robinson preached from Ezra chapter 8, verse 21, which was very appropriate. In Ezra chapter 8, the great Hebrew scholar Ezra led a group of exiles back to Jerusalem and back to Judah. Before they left Babylon, they had a worship service. Ezra eight twenty one says, There by the Ahava Canal I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves to our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. The famous scene has been immortalized in a painting, The Embarkation of the Pilgrims, which is in the rotunda of the United States Capitol building. It shows Pastor Robinson with a large open Bible surrounded by men and women and children who are kneeling in prayer as they prepare to set off on their arduous journey. One of the members, William Bradford, later wrote about the send-off service at the Dutch harbor, saying, With mutual embraces and many tears, they left that good and pleasant city, which had been their resting place nearly twelve years, but they knew they were pilgrims. That's where the term pilgrims comes from in relation to this group. The English word pilgrim means someone who is not at home where they are. They are traveling. They are on a journey, especially over a long distance. They are wonders, especially in a foreign place. The Bible says of the heroes of the Scripture in Hebrews 11.13, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were assured of them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The group sailed for a British port and then boarded a creaky little ship in Plymouth, England. It was called the Mayflower. But the pilgrims were not the only ones on the Mayflower. 
There were 41 of the pilgrims or separatists, but there was another group of about 60 people traveling just for adventure or perhaps in hope of financial gain or maybe to escape their situations in England. And then, of course, there was the crew. And all 135 souls were crammed and jammed aboard that little ship. The Mayflower should have sailed during the summer when the weather was better, but there were delays. She didn't sail out of Plymouth, England until Wednesday, September 6, 1620, and September isn't particularly a good time to begin a cross-Atlantic journey. It would take over two months, 67 days to be exact, to make the voyage. As I said, this was a small ship. It was only 12 feet longer than a tennis court, and the Mayflower had never been designed as a passenger ship. There were no rooms or beds or berths or bunks. It was a cargo ship, and the only place for the passengers was the gun deck. And it was quite small and dark, only about 25 feet by 15 feet at its widest point, and it wasn't high enough for a grown-up to stand or right. This is where the passengers slept, changed their babies, cooked their food on top of carefully watched flames, often went to the bathroom and everything else. Even worse, the weather was treacherous, and the waves were high enough sometimes to make the ship roll and pitch. Virtually everybody became seasick, and they also became wet and cold because it was impossible to keep the ocean water from draining into the cargo hold, and some of the storms were terrifying. Kevin Jackson, in his little book, Mayflower, the voyage from hell, said. The constant noise was another torment. A powerful storm can be alarming enough on land, but on sea the air is torn with the sound of wind, screaming through the rigging, the crashing of water against timber just feet or even inches away, the sickening groan of the hull as the elements batter it, and the booming of unsecured sails. At night for our travelers, the terrors were even greater. There was also a sizable population of rats and roaches making the voyage. It sounds to me something like being imprisoned in a foul, dark, smelling, unsanitary dungeon for two months, one that constantly lurches and pitches and spews forth unexpected showers of cold and salty water. But these pilgrims, well, they were sustained by the Scripture. Every day they read the Bible, and one day the passage was so timely and incredibly appropriate that the passengers knew it was providential. It happened halfway through the voyage on September 22nd, when they were in rough seas. The psalm for that day was Psalm 107, and these were the words. Some went out on the ship and seas. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep, for he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. That's a portion of Psalm 107. It's the portion that really spoke to them. It's a wonderful psalm for us all to read and to meditate on. Well, the Mayflower finally came within sight of the New World. On Friday, November 10, one of the sailors called Land Ho. They had expected to be further to the south at the mouth of the Hudson River in the general vicinity of modern Manhattan. But they had traveled instead to the north and were at Cape Cod. That meant they were going to establish a colony outside of Great Britain's territorial boundaries in the New World. They would be establishing a town without an overseeing government. And so they drew up a remarkable document aboard ship. It was called the Mayflower Compact. America's first constitution. It said, In the name of God, Amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, 
king defender of the faith, and having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politique for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereto do an act, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time as shall be thought meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the reign of our sovereign Lord King James, for England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, and O'Domini, 1620. In other words, they gave tribute to King James, but they said they had come to America for the advancement of the Christian faith, and they were going to organize and govern themselves. They disembarked and called their colony Plymouth which was the name of the port from which they had sailed in England. Their voyage took them from Plymouth, England, to Plymouth Harbor in New England. Well, the days to come were terrible. They arrived just as winter arrived, and how they survived, and how the Indians helped them, and how they later celebrated Thanksgiving together is a well-known story. But behind this story is a Christian, a biblical and incredible act of faith and courage. It was also the beginning of what we now call the Puritan Migration. Over the next 20 years, some of the most godly, best educated, and most remarkable British citizens, the Puritans, would be driven to the New World by persecution. More about that in the next episode. But for now, think of this, that a group of Christians would risk everything to establish a home on a new continent where they could worship in freedom that they would be sent off with the words of Ezra the scribe and be sustained by the words of Psalm 107, that they would establish a covenant for the advancement of the Christian faith and that they would forever be enshrined in our national memory by their feast of thanksgiving with their Native American friends. Well, that is why we remember them. And in so many ways, this was truly the beginning of America. Thank you for joining us for today's podcast. In coming weeks, Rob will release a series of podcast episodes inspired by his research and writing of 100 Bible verses that made America. While these stories are masterful and inspiring at any time, if you subscribe to this podcast, you just might find timely encouragement to seek scripture and to pray for our nation as we launch into a tumultuous election year where people seem more polarized than ever. Perhaps we can unite around the same scriptural principles that have guided our nation in days past. These stories will tell you how that's happened in the past and give you hope that it can happen again. Special thanks to Jordan Davis for his arrangement and production of Battle Hymn of the Republic and When Morning Gilds the Sky from today's podcast as background music.